speaker today is Dr. Kelly Ward. There's also Senator Kelly Ward, and she wears both hats skillfully. <laughs> what does that mean? <clears throat> and with full confidence in her ability, she's earned her BS, of course, BS, in yes. psychology it's from psychology. Duke, <laughs> Duke University, her Doctor of Osteopathic Medicine from West Virginia School of Osteopathic Medicine, and her Master's Degree in Public Health from A.T. Still University. She lives in Lake Havasu City with her husband and fellow doctor, Mike Ward, along with their three children, Cameron, Katie, and Nick, plus little dog, Rosie. <coughs> Respected conservative website, Breitbart.com, calls Kelly a rising star. Oh, that's for sure the truth. You'll soon see that Kelly is smart, determined, energetic, and personable. She is what we need now more than ever. Amen. <clears throat> there is little question that our Dr. Kelly Ward is definitely the light, right medicine to cure Arizona's ills. Please welcome Dr. Kelly Ward. It's great to see everybody here. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, for me, there is nothing like being in a room full of motivated, knowledgeable Republican voters. So thank you all for being here, sharing this time with me. I, uh, you know, I guess you've heard that I am going to be challenging Senator McCain in the primary, in the Republican primary in 2016. Yeah. Well, it sounds like a lot of you are ready for a new BFF, a bold, fresh, fearless leader to go into Washington, D.C., new leading and new ideas. And that's what I can do for you as your next U.S. Senator. We all know that Washington, D.C. is not working, right? It's not working. It, it can't innovate. It can't get out of its way. And we're sick of it. We're, we're tired of it. But the only way that we can change Washington, D.C. is by changing the people that we send there. We can't just rearrange the pieces on the board and expect a different result. We have to actually send new people down into Washington, D.C. to be able to get what we want. Um, I'll tell you that I believe that 30 years in the Beltway has changed, has changed Senator McCain. Yes. If it weren't true, I would not take this on. I will tell you that. Um, you know, we, we deserve more than Beltway speak and D.C. lies and promises. We deserve a different kind of senator. Now, I want to give you a little bit of straight talk, to borrow a famous phrase. <laughs> I'll give you some straight talk about Senator McCain's voting record. Just in the last few years, he's voted for so many things that, that, that I don't agree with and I don't think most of you agree with. He's voted for amnesty. He's voted for tax hikes. He's voted to, um, to fund Obamacare. He's voted to, um, to, for bailouts for his crony capitalist friends. He's, he's voted to increase the debt ceiling 14 times. Uh, he, has, he, he made fun of the conservative senators who wanted to shut down the government in order to get rid of Obamacare. And to me, that is, um, is just an abomination. Uh, that should have been something that we joined together as a party to, to right. do because Obamacare needs to go. Let me tell you, this is going to be a hard-fought battle. I mean, I've talked to a lot of you, and you're like, you're going to have a hard time. It's going to be difficult. I know this is a David and Goliath fight. Um, you have to remember, though, David did win that one, right? Um, it's going to take hard work. It's going to take money. It's going to take boots on the ground. It's going to take all of us joining together to do it. But I think that it can be done. And for me, the stakes are simply too high for me to sit idly by and, and wait for someone else to step forward to take on this task. As a physician, I have seen the ravages of Obamacare on our excellent health care system. Right now, I work in the emergency depart department in rural Arizona, and I see the good, the bad, and the ugly of Obamacare. There might be a tiny bit of good, maybe a teeny tiny bit of good. I'll, I'll give you that. But there is a lot of bad and there is a lot of ugly. And we have got to fully repeal Obamacare. Yes? And I don't want to hear about, the, oh, well, what are you going to replace it with? Well, as a doctor, if someone has a cancer, you don't cut out the cancer and then replace it with a little less bad cancer. Um, we need something completely different. It needs to go away. We need to have a free market approach to our health care system. We have to have transparency in pricing. Yes, transparency in pricing at the hospital level, at the doctor level. We have to have tort reform. 
we should have health savings accounts so people are able to have a tax benefit and then buy the kind of insurance that they want and the kind of health care that they want and need rather than settling for what the government is willing to give you. We, we have to get rid of that. And then everybody should have a major medical policy. They should have something for catastrophic care that's true insurance. Right now, health insurance is not health, it's, it's not insurance. Because when you buy car insurance, you hope to never use it, right? You buy it and you hope to never use it. That's what insurance is. If you buy life insurance, you hope the heck not to use it, at least not anytime soon. And so that's what we need to have in the health insurance market as well, is that catastrophic care coverage so that if you do have a car accident or you develop cancer or you have a heart attack or you have a stroke or, or even you have a, a, a pregnancy, those things are what are covered by insurance rather than expecting um, everything to come out of that pot. Um, now, as an Arizonan, I have seen the ravages of what illegal immigration has been doing to our education system, to our health care system, to our DPS, our public safety system, to our correction system, and that has got to stop. I will tell you that when John McCain, the last time when he ran for the primary, um, and he ran against J.D. Hayworth, and he said, build the dang fence. I wanted to believe him. You wanted to believe him. We all wanted to believe him. What did he do as soon as he got in there? Well, worse than nothing, as soon as he got in there, he voted for amnesty. He voted for a bill that had hundreds of billions of dollars for illegal immigrants out of the taxpayer's pocket, and that is wrong. We have got to stop it. We have to secure the border. Um, now, also, I'm a military wife. You may have not, not realized that. My husband, Mike, and I are a great team. He is, has been in the military for 31 years. He, um, he's in the Air National Guard now. He was one of those kids who enlisted straight out of high school and then came home and told his parents, hey, Mom and Dad, guess what I did today? I enlisted in the Air Force. And they were like, what? They, he didn't talk about it or anything, just went and did it. Um, he's now our state air surgeon. But as a military wife, I can tell you that I have learned a lot about keeping promises to our veterans promises that are being completely disregarded right now, and it started right here at the Phoenix VA, and it's spread throughout the whole country. We cannot allow that to stand. We have to fix the VA, and we have to uh, honor what we promised our veterans who signed on the line to protect our freedom in, in our country. So that would be another big part of my campaign. And then finally, as a mom, you heard that I have three kids. You know, Nick, Katie, and Cameron, and Rosie, the, the furry kid. Um, <laughs> I, I never want anybody to sit back and accuse me of not doing everything I could to preserve liberty and freedom for them, for my future grandkids, and for all of, all of us and all of our futures. So that's why I'm running. Those are, are some of the reasons I'm running. Now, I'm also running for you. I'm running for you because I feel like Arizona deserves to have a Republican senator that represents their values that represents our values, and we are not getting that right now. We are getting served by a senator who has to fight being censured by his very own party, and that is not right. We have to have somebody who's willing to work to make D.C. work for us, not something that we are fighting against an overbearing federal government in our everyday lives, um, day in and day out. So that's what I would do whenever I go to Washington, D.C. I think you deserve more than broken promises. You deserve more than D.C. speak. I want to remake Washington, D.C. I want to have you join me and thousands of other Arizonans to send a, a person who has new ideas, who has a fresh, fresh perspective on things, and actually get things done. So I hope you all will join me and we together can shake up D.C. And with that, I want to take questions because I know you guys have a lot of questions. You don't want to listen to me talking at you. I want to talk to you. So I welcome questions, and thank you very much. Ready? Uh-oh, that's it. Oh, it's, okay. It's got the what light. do you think of birthright citizenship? I, I, <laughs> I think that the, the 14th Amendment has been misinterpreted for many years, and I hope that there, that a test case comes and we are able to stop that. Because why would we ever reward someone who came here, or two people who come here, create a child, they come here illegally, and then suddenly we reward them with United States citizenship. I think that it's wrong. I think that it has to be stopped. Same with sanctuary cities. I'll, I'll, I'll add on to sanctuary cities. We need to get rid of those as well. I'm looking for ways that we can do that at the state level too, because I'm a state senator still for, for one more year. And I hope that we can look at ways to um, target those, those sanctuary cities within our state at the state level as well as at the federal level. That's one of them. Kelly, Kelly, there's a microphone. Yes. Okay. 
Um, here, here's what I would like for you to talk about. Because as an individual, you can do nothing. Yes. And I would like to know what kind of groups you think are working on the right kind of plans to replace Obamacare. Right. Uh, what kind of, what senators would you like to go in to work with who might actually be able to do things that are more conservative? Yes. Well, I mean, I think, I think that you're a, a tiny bit wrong because I think as an individual you can do something, which, which is have a backbone, have a voice, and be willing to stand on that and not bow to the pressure that's put on you as an individual. But you do that by joining with like-minded people in order to achieve. Uh, the senators that I kind of that I like to, to uh, emulate and I would hope to be able to hang out with in Washington D.C. people like Ted Cruz, Mike Lee, um, Rand Paul. You know they have they have stood up, especially on the Obamacare issue. And um, I love what Ben Carson is saying because about health care because he has that same kind of philosophy of of allowing people to make choices about what they need, not the way the president said. If you like your health care, you can keep your health care. If you like your health care plan, you can keep your health care plan. Which we're all just total lies. Actually, allowing you to utilize your money to get what you want and need, rather than pay for things that you don't need. But you know. Pay for birth control if you don't need birth control. Pay for you know obesity treatment if you don't need obesity treatment just because other people need it, and, and that's just a uh, redistribution of wealth. And so, so those kind of things. I mean, I think that there are a lot of groups working on it. I, I'm a big fan of the uh, American Association of Physicians and Surgeons. They are, in my opinion, the only group that rep that that <laughs> represents physicians and patients. And uh, you know, I, I do think that the House of Medicine has sold me out and has sold all of us out as patients. And I consider the House of Medicine, the American Medical Association, the American Osteopathic Association, AARP, those kind of groups have utilized their clout and their membership to push through this socialized medicine that Obamacare is on the way to single payer, which um, single payer, if you look around the world, does not work. So those are the kind of things, people that I'll be working on. Okay, up here. Yeah, um, first I want to make a comment. Uh, I'm in insurance and I sold a lot of health insurance. They, uh, the Obama administration it isn't, Obamacare is not insurance. What it is, it, it's a welfare program that gives away medically unnecessary activity and, and function. I, I mean, you get all these things that you don't really need and, and uh, the lab tests, etc. And if it's for if you have an illness and you have a need for a lab test, then you got to pay for it when it's medically necessary. But but that's the one thing I've never heard anybody else, yes. other than me, well, say you're, that you're exactly over right. the years. But uh, <coughs> even more critical though, uh, I had a uh, a friend of mine had a very bad experience. His mother was in the hospital. Uh, she was. Uh, on life support, he had a full medical power of attorney, local hospital, refused to allow him to get time to run to a court or run to his attorney, and they pulled the plug. They gave him like an hour and a half notice, and they said, we're going to pull her off life support, and you can't do anything about it, essentially. Because because she had an advanced directive that said that, or because no, they just felt no, like No, he had full medical power of attorney. <laughs> And, and uh, I, I've got a copy of it, and I'll send it to you if you want. But uh, he had, uh, the hospital gave him a copy of a directive from uh, the health, uh, uh, the federal health authorities. And it essentially said that you cannot be held liable as doctors or a hospital for inappropriate action. So in other words, you know, anything that, that uh, the doctors thought was inappropriate in, in order to save life was unnecessary. And, and so she died, of course, and he had no, uh, I mean, he hasn't been able to do anything. He's talked to numerous people about it, but uh, I, I don't see why uh, federal regulators can control the hospitals like that and and the person who's even the legal medical power of attorney had no uh, control right well you know I, I'm not sure in that particular case but the hospitals have jumped right in bed with the federal government and have basically become an arm of the federal government not only the American Medical Association the hospitals and the hospital associations as well 
And so, um, and something you mentioned, we have taken a lot of people who had private insurance before that was giving them what they wanted and what they needed, and we have transitioned them into Medicaid. And Medicaid is on all of our backs as, as Arizona taxpayers, and um, it is decreasing access to care, it's decreasing quality of care, and it's increasing the cost of care. Those are all things that we don't want to do with our healthcare system, and that's what Obamacare is driving us to do. Uh, Kelly, I have a question for you. Uh, if you remember when we took economics somewhere in high school or college, they told us about the economies of scale, right? And they told us that if you have bigger and bigger programs, it's going to be cheaper and cheaper. So how come that fails so badly with Social Security, Medicare, Obamacare, education, all kinds of war on poverty, all these federal programs that we've had since, I guess, World War II that keep on getting bigger and bigger, and we know they're more and more inefficient rather than we thought would be cheaper and cheaper. Yeah. And people kept voting on them because they love the service, they love the benefits. That never really happened. Right. So what went wrong? Well, because in economics we were talking about the private sector, and you're talking about the government yeah. sector, the public sector. Uh, and so the public se sector never has to suffer the consequences of bad decisions because they can just reach right into our pockets and take the money for the product, for the programs. And so I do think that that is something we have to do. We have to. I, I want a pro-growth approach. Approach. However, I think that we do have to control the spending. And you can't say that um, simply not funding a program costs anything. Not funding something doesn't cost anything. But the Democrats and a lot of the big government Republicans would like to say, well, um, you know, we're not going to have this money if you cut taxes. Right. And so that means if we cut taxes, you have to control your spending and you have to decrease the size of different programs. And you have to get rid of redundancy. And you have to look outside the box. I mean, I think with Social Security, we have to look outside the box. Social Security is going to, as we know it, is going to end. Because right now, when it started, there were 39 people for every one worker. Now there are two people for every one worker. And every penny that comes in, we spend it right away. There's no investment. There's no savings. And so, because of that, there can be no prosperity. And so the federal government is known for raiding those lock boxes and using that money for anything that they see fit, not just things that are functions of the federal government, but anything that they think the federal government could do. And that's what we have got to reel in and stop doing. So well, that I we hope those two people funding my Social Security are making a lot of money. All right, exactly. I hope so, too. I hope so, too. Would you raise the retirement age? Um, no, I, I don't think that I would say raise the retirement age at this point. I am working on some policy regarding welfare reform and, and Social Security reform because I, I think that Chile has done some great things because they kind of privatized or at least allowed some privatization of their Social Security system. And everybody from the poorest poor to the richest rich have benefited from that. But if people still don't, they fear that and they don't want to go into the public or into the private sector, I think that we can leave Social Security the way it is. And if that's what they choose, that's all they'll get. But I think that people will see as we transition, they'll get a lot more and have a lot more prosperity in their retirement than they do right now under the government. Uh, to simplify an answer to your question, yes. is the chamber members and the corporation financing John McCain, it went into their pockets. That's where your money went. So they well, stole a lot of the money, money. I mean, look at the Phoenix, uh, the the uh, the train. You know, the, all of that money is going into people who benefited from building the chamber, the, the, well, the chamber people and others as well. So. The, my question for you is: Right now, we're under the threat of thousands of immigrants coming here, and we're told that they're dying women and children. But we see these growing men, 20 to 25 years old, getting off the boats. Now, our country only has to be wrong once. One dirty bomb in a football stadium of 20,000 people, uh, one bomb on a bus, one mass shooting taking place, all of a sudden we're losing all our gun rights because we imported these people shooting everybody. And uh, our country's turned upside down. And, uh, you know, I was told by a general yesterday on the radio when I called in, he goes, well, we're doing our best to vet them. Well, I don't care about your best. Do you got it or not? What's your answer on that? You know, I, I think that uh, 
that border security is national security, whether it's from the people coming across from Central America, Mexico, and who knows where else into our country illegally sneaking across the border, or the people that some in our government want to willingly bring in, some, some estimates of 70,000 people from Syria coming into our country that we have no idea about. Um, on the day, yeah, on Wednesday, I thought it was interesting on Wednesday because there was a report from Al Jazeera that was out that said, stop calling them migrants, start calling them refugees. And that same day, Senator McCain made a speech from the floor saying, stop calling them migrants, start calling them refugees. Those two things should not be coming together. They are migrants, and I understand that their country is under fire and their country is destabilized. We cannot bring every poor person, every, uh, every person under strife into this country. We have to help them in their own country to, to become strong. Everyone can't come here. We can't sustain it. We've got a huge problem with unemployment, uh, especially in min minority youth. They, they aren't able to find jobs. If we bring in 70,000 people, imagine just, okay, at TUSD, if, even if they got 20 of these kids, 20 kids, so, I mean, you know, there are some adults too, but 20 of the kids come in, how disruptive is that to that school, to that school system? They're people who don't know the culture, who don't know the language, but they're somehow entitled to taxpayer benefits like a free, educa free education. Um, I think that we really have got to examine this much, much more um, thoroughly than we have, and I don't think that politicizing it, like, like Senator McCain and Lindsey Graham just did this week, to say we have to, to bring in all of these migrants or refugees, as they'd like to call them, is a good idea for our country and for our national security. Here, here. Kelly, I really want to thank you for getting into the race. Thank you. We need somebody with your talent and your drive, and having heard you not only today, but at other times, you have what Arizona needs. And that leads me into the fact that you will help to assure the future of Arizona and its rise. There is an area that I'd like to plant a seed in your mind now for you to look into. The economic success of Southern Arizona as we enter 2020 and beyond is going to be greatly enhanced if we can negotiate, put together and put in the ground and bring up a deep water port in Mexico that will bring in... Al Melvin's. Yeah. Al Melvin's okay. idea, yes. Right, so and I love Al, by the way. Al, Just to say you know, I love Al. Right. And Al's been a champion of that. Other yes. people in this room have participated yes. in the formation of it and promoting it and so on. But we need people like you who will give it the support, not John McCain, who won't even give it lip service, right. much less anything else, because our future is very dependent on it since other of the five C's of Arizona have become a little tarnished with age. So good luck. Thank you. Thanks again. And let's go get them. Thank em. you. All right. Well, yeah, I appreciate that. I will tell you right now, I feel like we get D.C. represented in Arizona, not Arizona represented in D.C. And that is something that I I would would work very, very hard good to point. change. So. You're a doctor. Yes. I'm glad to hear that. Because we've got a situation where the government's got their nose in an area they shouldn't be in. And that's Planned Parenthood. Yeah. I'd like to have your comments in regards to that because I'm tired of paying taxes for something as the government doesn't belong in. I agree 100% and I have been out there um, talking about that quite a bit because as a doctor, um, I'm so happy that technology has caught up with, with science to be able to show people when life begins. To, well, to show them that there's actually life in there, that that's actually a little baby. Before, they, they could fool women, young women, minority women, some men too, into thinking that that was just a blob in there. That was just a blob, a blob of cells, it wasn't anything. Now, so early, we can see their little heartbeat, we can see their little hands and feet, and we know that there's a person in there. And um, that's why the opposition fights so hard against having ultrasound before abortion. Luckily in Arizona, we have that, and we fought hard, and I will fight hard to maintain that. Uh, just a quick story, my husband's an ER doc, I'm a family doc, but I work in the ER now. 
but he's, I know, saved a lot of babies' lives by bringing the ultrasound over just in the in emergency room and putting it on that lady's belly whenever she says, oh, I'm thinking about having a termination, I'm thinking about aborting this baby. And letting her hear that heartbeat is just amazing. What Planned Parenthood is doing with selling baby parts from aborted babies is horrific. And it has got to be stopped. And I think that it is worth shutting down the government over. If there is not a time to stop Planned Parenthood when they're selling baby parts, what is a good time? When I hear the Republican leaders saying, well, now's not a good time. We're not going to be able to do that right now. When is a good time? We, we have to stop it. We have to stand up as people who believe in protecting all innocent life. We have got to stand up and we have got to say no. We've got to put the pressure on John McCain because he said, oh, yeah, I'm willing to shut down the government. Oh, no, I didn't really mean to say that. I, I, I'm not willing to shut down the government over this. It's not a big enough issue. Well, it is a big enough issue. It's about life. It's about our future. And it's about, it's about the heart and soul of America. Because if we're willing to allow that to happen, what's next? What's next? So. Thanks for your opinion. Hi, Kelly. Thank you um, for uh, making the sacrifice and running against McCain. Thank you. I know it takes a lot of courage. It's not easy. It's uh, you know. No, I, it's I've not heard easy that he's challenge. not very nice, but he hasn't been super mean to me yet. But I'm, I'm waiting for it to come. I'm building up my thick skin. Well, my, we my needed someone friend. like that, so thank you for stepping you. up and filling the void. Two quick questions. First off, um, when I moved down to Arizona, um, the state debt had been slowly going down, slowly going down. This is a good thing. Currently, it's slowly going up. Will you promise to do what you can? I understand you're only one among a many. I'm but 90. Can well, you, 91. Can you do what, what you can to change that trend and, and get the state debt? Can you promise at least you, you'll give it your all? Yes, I will, and I have. I mean, you know, the budget last time was not a popular budget. I will tell you that. I mean, we got a lot of pressure. We were getting arrows at us from every direction, even from conservatives on some, some things that they wanted more money. I think that we had to tighten our belt, and I think we are going to have to continue to do that over some time. People like to forget about the debt. Um, they like to just pretend like it doesn't exist and that we're doing, doing great. Um, you have got to pay off that debt in order to fill in the hole that we put ourselves into so that we have a firm foundation in Arizona to soar economically. And, and that's what I will continue to work on. I believe debt you suffer. Yeah. So, you know, the, unfortunately, the, uh, the Democrats believe debt is good. Uh, yes. The other question is, knowing you, you have an insight in the medical field, is there any plan out there that cuts the insurance companies and the government out of the relationship between patients and medical facilities and doctors? In other words, is there anything like a, um, a medical facility uh, nonprofit insurance or anything like that? Yeah, there are several things that are out there even right now that cut the middleman out. One is, is called direct primary care, and that was under assault two years ago. I actually got a bill bill passed to protect direct primary care, where, believe it or not, patients could just go to a doctor and they could get what they want without the middleman, without the government, without the, the insurance company. But the Department of Insurance in Arizona wanted to regulate it as a mini health maintenance organization, HMO. And it had nothing to do with a mini HMO. It was, it, and it's out in Sholo, and there is a huge population of poor people out there who are now able to get care from a doctor who cares about them. I really think that Obamacare is devised to uh, basically tear up the doctor-patient relationship, to completely decimate it, and to make you all think as patients that the computer is actually your doctor or your provider. You don't, you don't even, everybody doesn't need a doctor, your provider. And whoever's sitting on the other side of it should be just fine with you, whether it's a doctor, a nurse, a PA, or some other kind of healthcare provider that we don't even know about. For me, I think the doctor-patient relationship is so important to health of that individual patient. And I don't want to kill the art of medicine, which is the, the interaction between the doctor and the patient. The science is there, and the science is what we utilize every single day, but the art is how we take care of each one of you individually, and Obamacare wants to kill that. Hello, Kelly. Um, I, I have to comment on the doctor thing. I, we have a doctor in San Francisco. We live there and here. And uh, several of the doctors in San Francisco have a deal where you buy your insurance through them. You pay them an annual fee, whether it's $500 or $1,000, and it takes care of so many visits and so forth. I think that's kind of cool. 
Um, but what I wanted to say what, uh, earlier was, I don't know if you read the book Freakonomics by these two economists, yeah. and one of the things they say in there is, the reason the crime rate went down in the urban environments um, 20 years after Roe versus Ray or whatever, was all these babies never were born to grow up to become criminals. It's an interesting point of, point of view that the, some economists believe. Um, my question though is, let's say we stop these 50 billion abortions going forward or whatever, what's going to happen to those kids? Who's going to adopt them? What kind of lives are they going to have? Especially if they're born from women who are addicted to poor, or addicted, yeah. rape victims, incest victims, whatever. You know what? What will happen other than God will provide? I mean, I, I don't know where that's going to go. Well, my idea think? is that we have to strengthen the family. We have to strengthen the idea of personal responsibility, so that before a life is created people are able to make a, a better choice, rather than saying, well, I, I don't have to have any responsibility because I can always kill this baby if I want to. If, if they didn't have that choice, then before, whenever they decide if they're going to have intercourse, this excludes, obviously, victims of rape and incest, um, but, you know, in, in general, people can make a good decision whether to have intercourse or not. And, you know, and people ask me about birth control. I think that, that birth control is very, very widely available. I think that um, if you decide, I'm going to use doctor terms, so sorry. If you decide to have intercourse, it's either for procreation, where you do not need birth control, or it is for recreation. And if it's for recreation, we don't, the government doesn't pay for recreation. It doesn't pay for me to go to the beach. It doesn't pay for you to go camping. It doesn't pay for your ATV gas. Um, and so if you are going to have sex for recreation, then, then that, that's on you. And, and women can get birth control for $8. They can get it free at many, many places. And so I think that stressing that's that like personal responsibility is important. The schools, we won't have criminals. Well, I mean, I, mean, I, I, I think that the... Well, well, no, it's not, because a lot of so young, we throw the schools young, a lot of young ladies right now are skipping out. Oh, I don't, I'm too lazy. I'm going to lay at home today and watch cartoons and go out and have sex tonight because the government will pay to abort my baby. Well, or... Uh, oh, it's true. It's true. Yes, so, That's sir. Yeah, yeah, doctor, uh, I'm interested in... Uh, and malpractice insurance. I think that Arizona should go along with uh, Texas. Texas. Me too. I'm with you 100 percent. We need to have tort reform. In Arizona we need to have tort reform across the United States because there's a lot of medicine that's pra practiced uh, as CYB. However you're behind. <laughs> and, uh, and because there's always the worry that if you miss something that somebody's going to be out there ready to have their ship come in based on your malpractice policy. So we do. We need some tort reform. Definitely. 100%. Dr. Ward, it, it, one of the things that I like to know, there's a, there's a surgery center in Oklahoma City. I don't know if it's Oklahoma City. Someplace in Oklahoma. Have you heard of it, Dr. The, Smith? The guy that does all yeah. the surgeries for cash? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Why, why doesn't that spring up somewhere else? Why is it happening just there? Well, it takes a brave doctor, number one. It takes somebody who's willing to say, hey, I'm not going to live off of Medicare and Medicaid telling me what to do and what my services are worth. And so it's, it's a big leap for a lot of people. Um, I think that the people who have been in practice for a long time are, are ready to just say, I'll just retire. The people that are in my generation are kind of stuck in the, in the middle because we like being free. We like being entrepreneurial, but there are less and less opportunities to do so. The kids who are in medical school right now are being brainwashed. I will tell you, I've been in medical education. I was in medical education for seven years as the director of medical education at Kingman Regional in charge of two residency programs, family medicine and emergency medicine. As they're coming out, they, um, they're they being told that they're, you know, they basically have the ethical obligation to take care of people whether they get paid or not. They um, they also think that they'll work an eight-hour day. They also expect to still be paid a lot. Um, and, and so I don't know how the, the students that we're turning out are going to be able to function in an entrepreneurial world, but I think that the goal of government is so that they don't have to, that they can be a part of this single-payer plan and they won't rise up because they've been brainwashed as even as a student. Um, but, you know, I had some of my residents... You know, whenever I was a resident, I wanted to know where the bar was so I could see how high above it I could go. We, our residents are like, where's the bar so that I could barely touch it? I had one even ask me, what do you mean I have to answer my pager? I mean, where is it written in the, in the, the 
the, uh, the, the book about the residency that I have to answer my pager. Really? I mean, you're a doctor. You have people's lives in your health hands. People are depending on you. Um, those aren't the kind of questions I want to hear from my doctor, but those are the kind of questions that the government would like your doctor to be able to ask. To answer um, Carol, Carolyn's question, in this city alone, the hospitals own and operate the FAST um, med centers. Yes. They control it. Uh, a doctor that would try to open one on his own and go on a cash basis or put up a, a price list isn't going to happen here because the hospitals are in bed with the Obamacare program and they just aren't going to allow that. And there's a huge exodus in this country of primary care doctors yes. getting out of primary care because I can go to CVS Pharmacy and have a nurse practitioner check me over for half the price. And Medicare has locked the doctors and they can only get paid what Medicare will pay them. Yes. To make a wage above that, which would be fair to cover their expenses, they aren't allowed to do that. Right. You're, so this is nonsense. Yes, well, they're, they're killing the free market, they're basically. Killing they're killing the free market, and, and it is true. I mean, and, but doctors are fearful. There, there are fearful doctors who say, well, I'll just get employed by the hospital. I always tell the hospital, you better employ them, and you better make sure they're hungry. Don't give doctors, I, I mean, and, and doctors probably don't like when I say this, but don't give doctors a gigantic salary and then just pay them no matter what they produce. Uh, you know, for me, I started a practice from scratch. I, my mom and I, my mom's a pediatrician, so we opened a mother-daughter practice from scratch. We, we ate what we killed. You know, you, you had to bring in the business. You had to be, you know, see the patients. You had to generate revenue. Um, the, the people who are employed, I've seen employed doctors. Maybe you guys have too. I'm not saying they're bad doctors, but sometimes they don't work as hard because they're already getting the salary that they want to get. So instead of seeing 20 patients in a day, they might see 14. Well, that's six of you that don't get to be seen that day. And I think hospitals try to hold them accountable, but, but as they purchase practices, they want to stay afloat, they want to have access to care, and so it becomes a vicious cycle where, again, cost goes up, but access goes down and quality goes down. So I think, you know, I'm a, I'm a capitalist, I think that we should have the free market in healthcare. How much of the government do you think should be shrunk down Oh, I think, okay, there you go. I think a lot of it should be shrunk down. I think that the federal government has completely, so it well, it's completely overstepped its, um, its constitutional reasons for existence. I mean, if you want to talk about agencies, the Department of Education. The Department of Education yeah. at the federal level could go away. We have departments right. of education at every single state level. Yeah. There's already 50 of them. Why do we need another one at the federal level? That would be one. The IRS, if we can simplify the tax code, we could get rid of the IRS. The EPA needs to go. We've got agencies in our states who know how to manage our resources much better than a federal agency. It could go. Well, I mean, those are all, you know, big things that could go away, but at every step there's a place to shrink the size of government. At what point do you think state rights supersede federal rights? At what point would you vote in that direction? Every point. Uh, every point except for you know, national security, you know, our, our, our army, you know, the things that the federal government is supposed to do. I think the federal government has completely overstepped its, its bounds and it has basically obliterated states' rights. I am a, a firm believer in restoring the proper balance between the federal government and the states because right now the states are getting the short end of the stick and that's something that I would do at the federal level. I've been fighting for it at the state level, but I think we need partners at the federal level to actually make it happen. Could you kill the EPA while you're at it? Yes, they, they're on the list. <laughs> <laughs> Department of Energy? I just have to ask what your stand is on our Second Amendment rights. I'm 100% Second Amendment. Uh, I've I sponsored the Second Amendment Protection Act every year I've been in the legislature, which I think it's sad that a state would have to have a Second Amendment Protection Act. However, the federal government is trying to take away our gun rights, and, and I don't believe it. I think that we have the right to keep and bear arms. I don't think it's just for hunting. I think it's for protection of ourselves against bad people and also against a tyrannical government. Do you have an opinion on amendments conventions where the states 
pass yes. laws. Convention of states. Yeah, convention of states. Yes. I have been to several. I went to the first Mount Vernon assembly. That, that not the first, the real first, but the first of modern times. <laughs> <laughs> not, not in my other life. I was not there. Um, and, and I met with legislators from about 30 states around the country who are interested in restoring the proper balance between the states and the federal government. Because, you know, and, and I know there's fear of, uh, of surrounding it. I know that there's a lot of fear of surrounding it because we don't ever want anything to happen to our Constitution and, and the, the great document that we have right now and we function under. However, it is slowly being eroded right before our eyes and, and no one is doing anything about it. And so, um, if it takes a convention of states to put this country back on the right right track, then we have got to do it. And we've got to have the right people that attend that to get the right outcome. A follow-up comment to that is, the man sitting next to me, his name is Dr. John McElroy. Yes. You should get together with John and let him sit down and talk to you about the Constitution. <coughs> Between this head and this ear and that ear is a real vibrant brain. A great brain. A All right, great I look forward brain. to it. I, any, I, I would he be... would consult with you and, and make sure that you understand <laughs> yes. what's happening and how to defeat uh, every time somebody puts up the idea of having a convention of states, it's you know, they poo-poo it or whatever they, they call yeah, it. Yeah, right. They poo-poo it and they say, poo -poo no more. We don't want it. Right. Well, but look, every time that happens, you, the, the question we have to ask each other no, is, if I don't do this, if I don't have a convention of states, how does it benefit the person that's against it? And many of the people are the big overreaching federal government people, and they don't want things to change. They want the federal government to get bigger. We want the federal government to get smaller. We want local control. That's what I want. Uh, the, the government that is closest to the people is always the best government. One last, question. Oh, one last question, Roger. You're in uh, the finale. I was going to say, for over 20 years, I've been going up to the legislature every year and causing them problems. And I always watch Kelly go to her commi committees, or I watch her online in the videos. And she's very much constitutional. She just don't sit there and vote for your gun rights. She speaks for them. She breaks some eggs up there and calls people out. So. We need somebody like her at the federal level not to go up there and align themselves with people and to get things done, but to throw some wrenches into the things being done, to call it out, to come back home, and to tell you what these other people are doing. And that's the importance of getting it. I appreciate that very much. Well, I, I know it's time to wrap it up. I want to ask you guys to please keep in touch with me. I have a website, kellyward.com. I'm also on social media. How many of you are on social media? Facebook or Twitter? Okay, there's a lot more. We need more back there. No, yeah? Okay, yeah. And so join me there because there's a lot of conversations that happen. I have conversations with people that are on there. People who support me are there. People who hate me are there. And they're having conversations about where they want to see this country go. And so you have to remember, though, it's, it's kellyward.com, kellywardaz on Twitter, kellyward for Arizona on Facebook, and it's Kelly with an I because I care about the people. So go there, join me. And, and finally, I'll make a plea for, for uh, financial help. Of course, you know, this is a big race. Um, John McCain has over $4 million right now in the bank, and that's not even after this next reporting period that's coming. My first reporting period is coming September 30th. People are going to be looking at that report to see if they think I'm truly a viable candidate because even though if every person in this room wanted me to come, there are people outside that would say, well, she doesn't have enough money. She's never going to be able to do it. I think that we've seen in the David Bratt race against Eric Cantor in Virginia that you, can, you need money, but, but the heart and soul of the grassroots makes a big difference. So if you all can put in some money into my, my campaign from $5 to $20 to $2,700, which is the maximum, I would really appreciate it. You can do it here. We can take a credit card. We can take a check. We can take cash. And if you don't have any of those things with you, you can do it online at kellyward.com. So I ask you to please help me out. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Kelly.